for the rooms that are the BSL-4 pathogen actually right now, which is going to be <coughs> the Ebola virus. So Ebola virus belongs to family Filoviridae. Philo comes from filamentous. You see, the virus has filamentous structure. It has an envelope, and it has a single stranded negative RNA genome. This virus is a zoonotic virus, so it is present <coughs> normally, most likely in bats. We still aren't completely sure what is an actual reservoir for this virus is. Transmission to humans usually occurs after the exposure to the bad blood when bats are hunted and then after the successful hunt are butchered. Uh, there are some accidental transmissions from monkeys to humans, again, after the hunt. So when um, people hunt for bushmeat, they can uh, get exposed to that uh, virus. Transmission to humans is incidental. Virus does not normally uh, reside or infect humans. So transmission from human to human occurs through the contact with the blood or bodily fluids. In this case, bodily fluids include practically everything <laughs> from saliva to sweat to urine to feces. Sexual transmission is rare. There were several cases registered as sexual transmission of Ebola virus, and Ebola virus was detected in the semen of a gentleman who actually transmitted this virus to two women in Africa. So it's, it's quite convincing that it can be transmitted sexually, but again, it is extremely rare. This virus is not transmitted by a respiratory route, absolutely not. Now, I want to define respiratory route for you. If I would have Ebola right now, nobody in this room would ever get infected unless I spit on you, vomit on you, okay? If I would have measles now, every person in this room would get exposed to measles. Respiratory transmission refers to the aerosols that are formed during normal speech or respiration or breathing, not like coughing out massive chunks of mucus. Does that make sense? There's no fecal oral route. Now you have to understand that if you somehow manage to stick this virus into the foot, into the foot, and get it into the stomach without exposing oral cavity, you're all fine. Does that make sense? There is no vector transmission. Mosquitoes, ticks do not transmit this virus. Now, what are the symptoms? Severe hemorrhagic fever, which means bleeding, which means mainly internal bleeding. If you will Google Ebola virus or Ebola infection symptoms, you're going to get some pictures with people um, bleeding from the ears, eyes, noses. Nose bleeding is possible, ears and eyes, uh, a bit of an overshoot. The main problem comes when um, there are internal hemorrhages. Tissue, like muscle, liver, spleen, anything. This hemorrhages may lead to organ failure and dehydration and shock. Think about the whole process of hemorrhaging. Blood component, plasma, spills in massive amounts in the tissue, leading to the reduced blood volume. Reduced blood volume leads to the hypovolemic shock, decreased blood pressure, and so on. It was actually demonstrated that in patients with Ebola, simple treatment with IV fluids may decrease mortality rate from 90 to 10 percent without like nothing more just IV fluids and you know ibuprofen or Tylenol to decrease the, the temperature body temperature does that make sense just, just IV yeah. 
Have you been blood trash users? No, I'm just heavy. Just heavy. Just supply, supply the fluids. Um, one of the symptoms actually is diarrhea. So that's another reason why fluid supplement can be so valuable. <clears throat> case fatality rate is 50 to 90 percent. Now, what does that mean, case fatality rate, and how uh, does it differ from true mortality? True mortality would be if we know every person that was exposed and actually infected with the Ebola virus, and then we would know every person that died. Uh, in actuality, there are people who would get a ball and it was found to be true, would become seropositive, so the immune system will produce some antibodies. They will never have a full-blown disease, okay? They will never go to the doctor. They will get better. They will completely recover, and these cases will remain unreported. In the most recent studies in Africa, it was shown that it's true there are asymptomatic, some asymptomatic or mild cases of Ebola. So the first outbreak, registered outbreak, you have to understand, happened in Uganda in 1976, okay? And then those outbreaks were more or less infrequent for, I would say, main reason, nobody cared really. Uh, another reason was that the urban population in Africa was stalling at that time, and then it started to grow exponentially. So cities required more space, and people started to encroach on the wildlife, and that got them more exposed to zoonotic pathogens, including Ebola. If you would look at the dynamic of outbreaks starting in 1990s, there are more and more Ebola outbreaks, and their size increases with every outbreak. Uh, the most recent outbreak is going on now in Kenya. I don't remember the numbers, but there are several thousand people and in a ballpark of a thousand deaths. The main concern with the current outbreak in Kenya is that it is going on in the city, in the large multi-million city, with much higher chances of human-to-human -human transmission. The outbreak that kind of freaked out people and made Ebola famous, was in 2014-2015. <laughs> it happened in three countries, mainly Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. This graph on the right <clears throat> shows you the dynamic of cases, number of cases, registered cases. In these countries, uh, you can see that it was mainly Liberia and Sierra Leone showed the, the highest rate of growth. I'm not an expert by any means in terms of the healthcare structure or, you know, how efficient it is in these countries, but my hunch would be that healthcare system in Guinea, the dynamics is showed, <clears throat> the dotted, life, the dotted line <clears throat> is better than in Sierra Leone or uh, Liberia. So these are the numbers. These are, you can see, that map <clears throat> shows you, sorry, <coughs> the total number of cases in these three countries. And you see that the vast majority of them were in Sierra Leone and then there was Liberia. What are the final numbers? 28 and a change thousand cases that were described as a ball of art. 15,000 confirmed cases. What does that mean? Well, here's the deal. If you have a person who runs 104 fever, has headache, um, low blood pressure, diarrhea, um, demonstrates, I don't know, subcutaneous hemorrhage, and in the midst of an outbreak region, it's probably a ball. So that would be diagnosed as a ball. 15,000 cases refer to the ones that were actually clinically confirmed in the lab. Not all of them were. 11,000 people died out of 28,000, which is not really, I mean, every death is a 
is a terrible tragedy, but if you think about the way it was presented, it wasn't as bad as it was demonstrated here in the United States. What was the reason for that outbreak? The main reasons that um, the public health system in these countries are completely deteriorated, and there is a, a huge mistrust between the population and the government. Um, there were reports about government workers being attacked on the duties. And I'm not referring to military or police. Uh, when you have an Ebola outbreak, and there were literally people dying on the street. So people could, like, you know, try to walk to the hospital, didn't make it down on the street. So you, somebody has to take care of the corpses. There were special government teams that drove around in protective equipment, collected corpses, and uh, buried them in a specially designed <laughs> cemeteries because you cannot do it, you know, using regular procedure. Those folks were attacked by locals because locals thought that, you know, the corpses of their beloved ones were taken for some inhumane experiments, okay? And you can totally understand, you know, there is a, there's a good deal of mistrust because of all the bad deeds the government. Um, so government was kind of negligent, okay? There were not enough medical supplies. The main shortage, the main, the most critical shortage was in IV lines, gloves, and disposable gowns. I'm not talking drugs. You get drugs. There are no drugs. Just this stuff, the basic stuff, that is not even in question here, you know, it was in shortage. And, of course, WHO screwed up royally. They delayed the announcement of that outbreak as the public health emergency of the international concern. It's an official term, what I just said. Uh, it's, it's a weird acronym. And they delayed the delivery of, of the help. Does that make sense? The, the director of WHO, some woman, she apologized later. I just love it. I love international bureaucratic organizations. If somebody would offer me a position, I would go there right away. You screw up, you cause massive damage to countries, you apologize, and said, you're not even losing your job. Pretty. Anyway, WHO screwed up. Eventually, uh, countries like United States, United Kingdom, all over the world, countries stepped up, sent medical equipment, sent medical specialists. The first response was from um, Doctors Without Borders and some other volunteering, or uh, Red Cross, Doctors Without Borders, and just, you know, people signed up as volunteers, just going to Africa, just helping out. So the outbreak like this, outbreak with people transmitting the infection of that type is absolutely impossible in the United States or Europe, okay? Now, was ever Ebola in the United States? The answer is yes. Actually, we had an, a, a legitimate Ebola outbreak in the city of Reston, Virginia. That was the first and hopefully the last outbreak. Monkeys started to die of hemorrhagic fever. And diagnostics demonstrated that it was Ebola virus. The strain was called Reston. <laughs> And it was shown that about 72% of the stuff that cared of monkeys, they were positive for Ebola. They never got sick, so it was really, really mild strain. But that's pretty cool. Uh, I used to say that Ridley Scott is going to make a movie. I think the phrase that Ridley Scott is going to make a movie was on Wikipage in 2007, so it's a long time to make a movie. He's still considering, I suppose. Now, the legitimate, severe Ebola cases in the United States, cases that were actually, that started in the United States. First one was in Dallas, Texas. Another great, fantastic story that tells you a lot about humans. A gentleman walks in the emergency room saying that he has fever. The attending physician 
asks him questions, takes medical history. One of the questions, did you go to Liberia or Guinea or Sierra Leone? And he says, yeah, I did actually, which was true. Uh, did you have contact with someone who had Ebola? No, I didn't, which was a lie. Physician said, oh, 104 fever, you were to Liberia, it's probably flu, go. He comes back next day in much worse state, admitted to the hospital, dies several days later because the disease progressed too far. In the process of caring, two <coughs> nurses get exposed. One of them, famous case, flies from Dallas to Cleveland and back. Everybody is up in arms. Every person on these two planes is checked. No exposure whatsoever. The bully is poorly transmitted really poorly transmitted. The nurse is fine, she's has recovered, and other nurses recovered too. Second case was in New York when uh, the doctor who volunteered in the in Africa came back, you know, slept in the morning, woke up, went bowling with friends, went to the restaurant, came home, next day woke up, a bit of a fever, came to our Ebola got treated, got fully recovered. So those are considered imported cases. Now there were a couple of medical evacuations. I'm not, I didn't hear much about Frederick, Maryland evacuation. So there was one to Omaha, University of Nebraska Medical Center, the gentleman who got sick in the States, in, the, in Liberia. He was from Liberia originally. He was the US citizen, but went back uh, to his country to help his compatriots. Uh, he got sick, was brought to Omaha, didn't make it, it's too late. Then there was a story about the doctor and a nurse, two nurses, that were flown to Atlanta, Georgia, University, Emory University Medical Center. Uh, it, was, it was a hilarious shit storm all over the news um, when people saw how they are transported from the ambulance to the clinic, somebody said, oh, ambulance is contaminated, we need to burn it. Really? It's cleanable. Um, and they're not like vomiting and spraying blood all over the place. Um, then somebody said, um, I even know the channel, but I'm going to withstand from naming the TV channel, uh, that they shouldn't have been transported by the military plane from Africa because we cannot expose our military servicemen to the risk of acquiring Ebola. Uh, well, the rebuttal was, they American citizens, aren't they? So we got to get them evacuated. And then the guy who piloted that plane said, he stepped up and said, I was fine. They were in the back of a plane, fully curtained and, and separated from me. I had no fear. I was totally okay with that. It wasn't even freaky. So those people were idiots. Um, so is Ebola an important mortality cause in Africa? Short answer is no. <laughs> That's the table from 2012 showing that HIV kills 1 million people every year. And then this one is tuberculosis, another million. And then there's diarrhea, just diarrhea, 600,000. Malaria claims half a million lives. I'm going to skip stroke. And we'll get to number seven. Birth trauma kills one third of a million kids every year. Okay. And this, nine and ten, are terribly disgusting because not in protein energy malnourishment hunger hunger kills more than quarter million folks in Africa and 10 meningitis is quarter million okay and meningitis is completely vaccine preventable this quarter million deaths occur in so-called meningitis belt that runs a little bit south to um, Saqqara Desert so you can see that if we will add this, there's going to be several million deaths. 
and many of them are either prevent well many of them are preventable tb deaths largely preventable malaria deaths are largely preventable hiv deaths are largely preventable by treatment i'm not talking meningitis or for the malnourishment that should be you know not even an issue so 11000 deaths although it's sad isn't something that adds a lot to the overall mortality okay and it's actually an easy fix build a functional pop well or super hard fix build a functional public health system okay <laughs> which is now what about treatment you can treat and now you can prevent monoclonal zmap antibodies show an incredible level of protection so uh, this was shown in monkeys that administration of zmap using certain protocol basically um, administration of zmap in triplicate okay <laughs> allows to protect animals 100 percent of animals from the lethal ebola infection and now we have a vaccine that's a great example of the vaccine that could have been created i don't know 15 years ago but wasn't because nobody's going to pay for it okay until u.s government european governments who stepped up and said all right we'll pay for it scientists got the vaccine out in half a year which was astonishing okay this is a recombinant vaccine extremely safe extremely efficient this shows you the percent of patients who got zero converted meaning that they develop response to vaccine response is dose dependent so if you give patients uh, 10 in the power of eight uh, particle forming units per mil it's a vaccine based on vesicular stomatitis virus it's not causing any disease like vesicular stomatitis but it causes extremely um, robust immune response protective immune response it is now used in africa uh, in the so-called ring vaccination so for instance if we're in this classroom and my blood work comes back and i am positive for Ebola virus infection, like Ebola virus is found in my blood, you're gonna get vaccinated because you were in contact with me. Does that make sense? But like faults in matter, no, they fine. So ring vaccination protects people who might have been exposed or may be exposed in the future. And it was, and it is a pretty effective method. Again, the problem is that people fail to report the disease or report it too late, it starts to spread, stuff like that. Does that make sense? Now, what if you have to take care in your clinical practice um, for the patient who is Ebola and you're concerned about the environmental contamination? Is it going to stay? On the hospital surfaces for an extended period of time um, Ebola is not an extremely stable virus <clears throat> so this shows you the survival of Ebola virus in water so you see in the span of four days in the fairly warm water it's gone like completely like it's not detectable so even water just water okay now this shows you that's very interesting graph that shows you the survival of Ebola virus in the blood okay so dotted lines sorry not, uh, gray lines represent uh, Ebola virus in drying blood so in drying blood you know on the floor Ebola virus will be completely gone and it's concentrations numbers will fall about five orders of magnitude you see it's pretty considerable okay 
It will be almost complete. It will be completely gone in six to seven days. In the liquid blood, bolivirus can survive for a really long time. So that must be considered when you know you take blood from the patients with the ball and preserve it. Okay, so survival rate in the liquid blood is extended. Blood extends the survival. What should you use to destroy Ebola? Um, these graphs represent the change in the virus titers, basically virus amount, <coughs> after the exposure to certain chemicals. Now, you can see that the best chemicals so far are concentrated solutions of hypochlorite or ethanol. Okay? So this, uh, the, bless you, the red graph here is ethanol, the blue is half percent sodium hypochlorite, the yellow is one percent sodium hypochlorite. What's sodium hypochlorite? It's a bleach, like regular household bleach, okay? So it's very attainable, very feasible, you can use it to clean. Now, what about the equipment that you use? Ebola survives the best on the non-absorbent materials. Some of this data just, you know, they are empirical. We don't really have any good explanation. I would, I would think it survives best absorbent, but no. So here you see the graph for the cotton gown, and you see that contaminated cotton will have no um, functional nor active Ebola virus in 24 hours. However, in on masks, stainless steel, or plastic gown, Ebola will survive for much longer. So these studies are actually really valuable to implement control protocols in the clinic when you have a patient with Ebola. Does that make sense? So which brings us to the general considerations for methods of controlling microbial growth. So first, so what can influence microbial growth and, you know, resistance of microorganisms? First of all, nature of microorganisms. The most resistant are bacterial endospores and prions. You may have heard the term prion. It's the protein that causes neurological diseases. You may have heard in the conjunction with met cow disease. In humans, it causes conditions like kreutzfeldt jakobs disease or hereditary familial insomnia. Prions are exquisitely resistant. Uh, one case in Dallas proves it in one of the Dallas hospitals. The patient who underwent surgery was diagnosed surgically with kreutzfeldt jakobs disease, meaning that he has prions in his blood. Prions are infectious proteins. Okay, are you with me? So... They will withstand exposure to UV light, um, common disinfecting agents like bleach or hydrogen peroxide, boiling, um, probably gamma rays for about six hours can destroy, structurally, you know, destroy them. Um, after thorough consideration, the decision was made to destroy the surgical room to get all the equipment out that was contaminated and destroy it and to refinish the room. Because the potential cost of litigation, if somebody would get exposed, although the chances were minimal, if somebody would get exposed and acquire prion disease, the potential cost of litigation would be astronomical. So they just refinished this whole thing. It wasn't too bad, like half a million dollars or something. Probably the most costly cleanup in the history of the world. So after bacterial endospores and prions, 
go protozoan cysts, fungal sexual spores, and naked viruses. So, protozoan cysts are the structures that protozoa form when they're exposed to the unwelcoming environment. It makes perfect sense that they're fairly resistant. Same is true for sexual spores. And the last group are various regular bacteria, enveloped viruses, fungi, yeast, uh, pro uh, replicating protozoa, trophozoites. So what you should know, if I give you the list, which of this list is most resistant or which of this list is least resistant, you have to be able to identify it. I promise not to make it confusing and complicated. It's going to be straightforward. So I'm not going to put on the same list, let's say bacteria, enveloped viruses, and trophozoan, trophozoids, uh, protozoan trophozoids. Does that make sense? So like microorganisms that are in the same group will not be <coughs> different answers. Am I clear? <coughs> now, bless you. How can you compare different types of control methods? Say, how can you compare the efficiency uh, of heating at different temperatures? Use the graph that reflects the number of cells on y-axis and time of exposure on x-axis. And for your method, you determine so-called decimal reduction time or D number, or D value. So D value is the time that is required to reduce the number of cells 10 times, or tenfold. If you look at this graph, you will see that at the 20 minute time point, the number of cells on this death curve was 1 million. Five minutes later, the number of cells on that death curve was 100,000. So, 1 million is 10 times more than 100,000. Does that make sense to you? So for this particular method, for this particular micro, the decimal reduction time is five minutes. Does it make sense to you? So few things to understand. First of all, please understand that lower D value, lower decimal reduction time, corresponds to higher resistance and vice versa. Now, let's say you have same method and you compare two different microorganisms, A and B. And I tell you, bless you, that decimal reduction time for microorganism A is five minutes and decimal reduction time for microorganism B is 10 minutes. Which microorganism is more resistant. Think about this. So, shorter reduction time. May I have? I may have misspoke before. We're going to figure it out. So, think about this. It takes five minutes to kill certain number of microorganisms, A, but it takes ten minutes to kill basically the same number of microorganisms B. Which one's more resistant? B. So, the lower reduction time means higher efficiency. I probably said something else. So lower, okay, misspoke. Lower reduction time means higher efficiency. Higher reduction time means lower efficiency. Let's say I'm going to tell you. I have a protocol for steam and protocol for dry heat. And for steam, but that same microorganism, decimal reduction time is 20 minutes. And for 
heat, decimal reduction time is 100 minutes. <coughs> Which protocol is more effective? Steam. The steam, because 20 minutes. Does that make sense? So understand this. Decimal reduction time is not chiseled in stone. It's going to depend on the temperature. It's going to depend on the pH. It's going to depend on the inhibitors. Now, um, in general, what do you think? If we increase temperature, how will it change decimal reduction time? Hmm? Decrease. Decrease. Yes. So the higher the temperature, the faster you kill the microbes. Does that make sense? Now, some micro, well, microorganisms, some agents or methods can be cidal, meaning they killing microbes, like bactericidal, virucidal. Does that make sense? And some are static. They stop growth. Is that clear? You understand that idea? Bacteria static versus bactericidal. Now, these graphs show you the potential factors, one of the factors that may influence the decimal reduction time. For instance, for spores, bacterial endospores, decimal reduction time will be higher because they are more resistant than vegetative cells. This graph shows you the difference between microbistatic and microbicidal agents. So you see that microbistatic agent will not decrease the number of bacterial or protozoan cells. Does that make sense? They will remain at the same level, static. They will not grow, but they will remain at the same level. Now, bactericidal agent will lead to a reduction in the number of the cells. So what are the main targets for microbial control methods? Uh, it can be cell wall, cell membrane, and internal structures, organelles, proteins, or DNA. Cell wall can be broken down by agents like oxidants or heat. What happens to bacterial cell if its cell wall is broken down? Lysis, yeah, wakes up. If the membrane is disrupted, for instance, by detergents, surface active components, the cell will start to disassemble. And if protein or nucleic acid function is altered by a variety usually of chemical agents, that leads to cells dying. Because they can, I don't know, replicate or they can produce ATP or something. Is that clear? Now, we're going to talk about... Um, various approaches, physical approaches first. And what I want you to focus on is the mechanism that these approaches employ in killing bacteria. Does that make sense? And the level of disinfection that they can achieve. Are they sanitizing? Are they disinfecting? Are they sterilizing? Can they kill bacterial endospores? Does that make sense to you? So we're going to talk about the temperature mediated <coughs> agents first. We're going to start with moist versus dry heat. And at the same temperature, moist heat is more effective than dry heat. Okay? So in moist heat, the mechanisms are coagulation and denaturation, coagulation of the proteins, denaturation of the proteins. In dry heat, it's either desiccation, <coughs> sucking out the water, or incineration, meaning burning. Now, incineration is extremely efficient method. We're clear? But it is challenging to apply to certain objects. You understand? Like, 
Uh, if you want to sterilize uh, a glass jar using incineration, you have to throw it in the actual flames. Uh, it's not convenient, let's put it this way. Labor-intensive and inconvenient method. So we use it for, like, wire loops. That's doable. Now these graphs here and the table here show you the survival curves and survival times for Bacillus subtilis exposed to wet versus dry conditions. Now what I adore about scientists is that, and I, I can never understand this, why do you have such non poorly overlapping range of temperatures. So I'm going to exemplify some of them. So we're going to look at 95 Celsius here. That's the dry heat. And 95 Celsius here. So you can see that on the graph, we're going to call it graph A. Okay. We're talking about hours. You see six hundred hours. It took days to decrease the uh, number of viable Bacillus subtilis cells at 95 degrees Celsius in the dry environment. Once you do it in the wet heat, autoclave basically, we start talking minutes. Okay, you see, almost completely gone by two and a half hours. Does that make sense? Now, the rest of it is, is really poorly represented. But if you, um, if you look at some of the, so if you look at some of the data, for instance, 77 degrees Celsius. Okay, you will see that for the wet heat, it took about 50 hours, okay, to almost completely destroy this microorganism. In case of a dry heat, you can get to the similar order of magnitude at 129, okay, we're talking hours. So you see how different the temperatures are for wet heat and dry heat. This table shows you the D values. We can actually compare only one of them directly. The D value, the um, decimal reduction time, at 95 degrees Celsius. For wet heat, it's 32 minutes. And for dry heat, it's 24,000 minutes. And a change. I mean, it's, it comes up to be 40, 55 hours, decimal reduction time. So these graphs are very convincingly demonstrating that dry heat is going to be less efficient at the same temperature compared to the wet heat. <coughs> Resistance to temperature control methods are the same in the spores are the most resistant okay and there are a couple of terms that i want to introduce here it's thermal thermal death time thermal death point so thermal death time or tdt it's the shortest amount of time that you need to kill all the microbes at the given temperature okay so for instance we're going to take it here thermal death time here, this graph, graph B, is 72 hours. That's the last measurement, okay? 72 hours, measurement is zero. Does that make sense? You understand that? So thermal death time for wet heat at 104 degrees Celsius is, well, 53, 52 minutes. Okay, in 52 minutes, all microbes are gone. Now, thermal death 
point is the lowest temperature that is required to kill all microbes in 10 minutes. Does that make sense? So for instance, for Bacillus subtilis, in terms of the wet heat thermal death point, okay, will be somewhere between 104 and 121 degrees Celsius. Because 121 kills all the microbes in 60 seconds. Well, maybe a little bit more. Does that make sense? And for 104, all are gone in 52 minutes. So somewhere in between. So I want you to match the definition to the term, thermal death time and thermal death point. <coughs> Now, these are the main methods of microbial control. I want to make very clear what I want you to know about each of these methods. You do not need to know any temperature regimens. So I'm not going to ask you, what is the temperature regimen for autoclaving, or for boiling, or for tindalization? Does that make sense? I absolutely want you to know the level of cleanliness. That's a lot, so I'm not going to ask the mechanisms, but I'm not going to, I am going to ask the level of cleanliness, and that's what we're going to tackle now. Ricardo, question? No. You got it? It's boiling. Disinfecting. <laughs> Boiling does not kill endospores generally, but it kills the majority of vegetative cells. Do I need to explain how to do it? Are you fine? Okay, good. Dry heat oven. It is sterilizing with a long exposure. Does that make sense? I mean, I'm going to I'm going to point your attention to the regimens, but you don't have to memorize them. So, for instance, look at this. 170 <laughs> Celsius for 2 hours, right? That's dry heat. We good? I'm going to skip incineration for a second. Autoclave. Look at settings. 121 degrees Celsius, 15 minutes at the elevated pressure. Sterilization. Both dry heat and autoclave are sterilizing methods. But dry heat requires higher temperature and longer exposure. Autoclave requires lower temperature and short exposure. Makes sense, right? Generally speaking, dry heat oven is convenient to sterilize small uh, heat resistant objects. For instance, you can sterilize the glassware. I know that in many labs, what can be done you wrap the glassware in a foil, stick it into the oven, close the door, turn it on, and go home. You come back in the morning, turn it off, or modern ones have a timer, so they will run it for five hours, and then it will just cool down. You come in in the morning, it's sterile. If you need to sterilize something fairly quickly, only autoclave. Does that make sense? Um, incineration. Um, what level of cleanliness do you think it can achieve? Can it kill everything? Yeah. Yeah, everything. It burns. Just burns everything. So obviously incineration is sterilization. Pasteurization. Okay, that one I love. Leap a stir at 
I personally want to praise for invention of vaccine against rabies. It's praised in France for saving the wine industry. It's more important than rabies in France, obviously. Um, he invented pasteurization process that we now use for practically all liquid products, from wine and beer to milk. So what does it kill, especially in milk? What does pasteurization kill? Compilobacter jejuni. Sounds familiar. Gastroenteritis. E. coli, sounds familiar, enteritis, salmonella enterica, sounds familiar, and that's salmonellosis, Yersinia par tuberculosis, even if it doesn't sound familiar, it's enteritic disease, okay, and listeria minocytogenes, you may have heard about listeriosis outbreaks, it's also, it's environmental and zoonotic microorganism. All these microorganisms can easily get in the milk. And <clears throat> pasteurization kills them all. Now, I told you before that there are no questions on the exam that concern the numbers, right? But I just cannot restrain myself from talking about pasteurization a little bit. There are three types, main types. One is called uh, bulk pasteurization. Uh, it's about 63 to 66 degrees Celsius for half an hour. You can do it at home. My only question, why? You can buy pasteurized milk anyway. Well, unless you have a cow. Um, second is high temperature. 72 degrees for 15 seconds. That's the milk that you buy in the grocery store. Gallon milk. Uh huh. Yeah. Fifteen seconds of exposure to that temperature is enough for all those microbes to be gone, basically. But this milk cannot be stored forever, right? Like it is a, an expiration date. It can go sour if you leave it. So. Basically, fridge will slow down the growth. If you leave the milk on the kitchen counter, it's going to go sour much faster. There's a third type called ultra-high temperature pasteurization, which pasteurizes milk at 121 degrees Celsius for two seconds. And this pasteurization is widely used in Europe and in Russia to pasteurize milk. You can find this milk here if you go in like uh, specialty aisles in the grocery stores. It's packaged in one liter carton boxes, usually produced by a company called Parmalat. It's an Italian company. The advantage of that milk is that it can be stored for up to six months. And it's super convenient, you know, we used to buy a whole package. It's 12 boxes, whole package. You could stick it in the pantry. And yeah, you don't have to store it at the room at, at, in the fridge. It's stored. It can be stored at room temperature. You stick it in the pantry. There's special packaging process. It's all automatically packaged. No humans involved, sterile conditions. You stick it in the pantry and just take whenever. Once it's open, it's not six months. Once it's open, it's like four or five days. Yeah, yeah. If you don't drink it, it goes sour. But when the package is sealed, up to six months. Like, and don't they uh, distribute them in smaller, in smaller containers? Like yes. Like yes. Okay. Yes. That's smaller that's containers with a straw like Horizon. That's the same idea. Ultra high temperature pasteurization. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Room temperature, you can store it. Great thing. Now, this just... To show you autoclave, this guy is extremely lucky. That's some fancy ass autoclave with a sensor screen. What we had is a, something like a spaceship from the 60s. Giant door with enormous wheel 
that you have to turn clockwise, counterclockwise, and there was certain order of turning that wheel and doing some other stuff. And if you miss the order, the door, which is like a, a bomb shelter door, will lean on the side and you have to call a special guy that would come in and fix it. Okay. In this autoclave right here, the door is lifted. Like click the button, goes down, click the button, goes up. You select the cycle, you go. Uh, refrigerator, bacteriostatic. Yes. Oh, disinfection. Yes. Sorry. Thank you. Disinfection. Absolutely. It doesn't get rid of all the microbes. Uh, refrigerator. Bacteriostatic. Generally doesn't kill microbes. Um, freezing. I mean, we consider it bacteriostatic. But microbes actually die when you freeze them without precautions, especially cellular microbes. Think about what happens. You have a bacterial cell or protozoa. Cell is full of water. Does that make sense? When water freezes, how does it, its volume change? It expands, cell pops, you got dead bacteria. Does that make sense? So you have to do some sort of protection. So. It's not used for the, con it's, it, it's used to like freeze so they do not replicate. We can put static too. Um, pressure. I mean, the, there are methods to treat food with high pressure. Uh, it was really interesting. Uh, I'm going to make a, a little, uh, Digression here, uh, you've heard about disease called uh, hepatitis A, I suppose. You all got vaccinated. <laughs> I never got vaccinated. It's not a, on the list. It's the best of hepatitis. Because it's got a week of diarrhea and you're good. Um, so hepatitis A is pretty common in the seafood. It's one of the main sources of hepatitis A transmission. And... You know, you always think, oh, I'm going to throw this shrimp in the skillet, fry it, or, I don't know, grill it, and it's going to be fine. So the study found that conventional cooking methods do not destroy hepatitis A virus to an acceptable level in the shrimp. And they asked, okay, what will destroy it? Well, basically, you have to scorch the shrimp so it's not edible anymore. You have to turn it into ash. In order, it's pretty resistant to ours. And they tried to use high pressure. High pressure didn't really work that well. Okay. Oxygen therapy um, used for gas gangrene treatment. Now, desiccation. Uh, drying out. Question? Oh, in terms of the uh, disinfection at best. Desiccation, yes. What's the deal with shrimp? As with what? As, as far as eating it, are you saying that that conventional cooking doesn't kill off? Doesn't. Okay. So I mean, like, is it just that we're exposed to such a small amount of virus that it's? You're all vaccinated. You're fine. Just eat the shrimp. Don't worry about it. There are a lot of other things that are present in shrimp that you should worry about. Don't worry about hepatitis A. Okay, you're going to be swell. Um, no, seriously, like get your vaccine, you're going to be all right. For me, I probably don't need this vaccine because I most likely was exposed. It can run asymptomatically. You may develop no symptoms and still get infection and get a protective immunity. So by certain age, physician will presume that I was probably exposed to chicken pox. I was probably exposed to hepatitis A, so they will say, ah. Um, desiccation drying. That's jerky. This is why jerky and raisins and all other dried foods can be stored for such a long time. You deprive microbes from water. Okay. Um, reduced water activity. 
salt. Not water, addition of salt. Salted meats, salted fish, jellies, jams, any sugar containing preserves. That's all. Remember we discussed how osmophiles can survive and everybody else cannot survive in the presence of high concentrations. That's you create hyperosmotic environment. Lyophilization, freezing out of vacuum. So all these three, basically bacteriostatic, they aren't designed for killing, they're designed for preserving. Lyophilization is used mostly in bacterial applications uh, some food you can think of some you know lyophilized proteins or something like that that can be stored as a powder but it's mainly used in the lab research to store microorganisms okay so I think we got so disinfection static static disinfection basically we have two well, three truly sterilization techniques. Dry heat oven, steam, pressurized steam, and incineration. Everything else is disinfecting or bacteriostatic. We're clear? Now, the question that I can ask, which of the following methods is disinfecting? Also, we'll get to this. There are going to be more broad questions. Which of these methods you would use Four. So, for instance, if I ask you which of the following methods you would use for sterilizing food, um, suggesting dry heat oven or incineration or autoclave is the poor idea um, because that will destroy the food practically. Does that make sense? So I will ask you about applications. So let's take a break.